All right, uh, I'd like to welcome you to the Forest Park Senior Center. Uh, look around, this is a really nice facility. We try to use it as often as we can and hopefully you'll come back and visit us. My name is Wright Gwynn. I am the Forest Park Environmental Manager and I will be your host tonight, not the presenter. That's for somebody else, but I'll be your host tonight. Today is, well, this presentation is the fourth of four. So we've already had three presentations in 2023. The, the first one was the coyotes in our neighborhood. The second one was using native plants in our landscape. And our third one was whose yard is it? Backyard wildlife issues, the critters or us basically. Okay. And all of those are on my website in case you weren't here physically to, to uh, enjoy the, her presentation. Just either give me a call or go to my website. They're there. You can click on them and watch them at your leisure. Now, before we start with the befuddled by birds, there are a couple things that we need to go over. Now, the first thing, if you haven't already gotten handouts, before you leave tonight, please help yourself to the handouts about uh, befuddled by birds. I've looked over them. They look really good. A lot of good information. Second table over there are the door prizes. We have some really good door prizes. So hopefully y'all will have lucky tickets and be able to get them. The way that we're gonna do it is it's gonna be after the presentation and after the question and answer period, then we'll go ahead and we'll draw the, the tickets out and we'll see who gets what, okay? And then after the presentation, and if you do have a question, Raise your hand, we'll recognize you. You need to come here and speak into the microphone so that it can be recorded on by the camera, okay? I know a lot of people raise their hand and then they start right away with their question. No, take a breath, come on up, use the microphone. And the most important thing is, we do have restrooms in this building. You can go through those doors and to the right and they're right there ready, ready and waiting for you. So tonight we do have a neat pre presenter. She, like I said, she's done four presentations for us this year. She has not disappointed. <laughs> uh, she's been an educator and a naturalist most of her life, adult life. She's worked with the great parks. She just recently started her own natural history and consulting organization called As. Uh, the crow, at, the crow the crow knows, knows. Yeah. and uh, she knows a lot so if you're ready carol sure. uh, it's all yours all right. we'll turn this back on. okay so we're going to be talking about some birds that you're most likely to see around your yard especially as you're moving into this winter season so you're not going to see pictures of hummingbirds tonight as much as we love them it's, they should have moved on by now but the question that I get a lot is, how do you tell one from the other? So are you befuddled by birds? <laughs> we get that question a lot. All right, so if you are, then let's look at who might be at your feeder. Do you know what this bird is? Cedar wax. A cedar waxwing, ding, ding, ding. She gets that. But look. I've wanted to see one my whole life. Your whole life. life. Well, they are right here in Forest Park in Cincinnati, and all they really need is a little bit of fruit in the spring and in this late fall season. And they have a really high-pitched sound. But look at those colors. It really looks like the tips of their wings were dipped in wax. What do you notice about his face? He's got a mask and a crest. OK, there might be a test, so pay attention. OK, a real quick. Easy bird ID. This is a bird. Got it? You know this? Don't say it out loud. You know what it is. All right? Pay attention to shape, size, beaks, so on. All right? This is a bird. Everybody knows this one? No questions asked? This is not. <laughs> all right. There you go. You know it all. So let's review. Let's go back to this guy. What sets this apart? I mean, this is probably one of the first birds you learned when you were a kid. Everybody calls it the red bird. This is the male cardinal. We're lucky enough to have so many of them here. And we get a little snow, and you might see two or three dozen out in your backyard, especially if you're feeding. What's unique about this bird? He's got 
this wonderful crest on the top of his head. I'm wearing uh, cardinal red tonight. He's got that black mask. Look at the shape of that beak. That tells you a lot about that bird. Are there other birds that you can think of that have a crest that are wild? <laughs> Not cockatoos or any of those guys. Blue jays, the tufted titmouse, the cedar waxwing. See, it's already working. You know some of this stuff. All right, so when identifying birds, you need to consider some of the following, the size and the color. That color may change per season or age of the bird. There's all these if, ands, and buts, aren't there? The beak and the feet, so what are the job that the beak and the feet have to do? You know, a, a duck foot looks a lot different than an eagle's foot, you know that. What's the behavior of that bird? Because that can tell you a lot about what's going on. Now I can tell you some of the behavior for, say, the wood peewee, but don't ask me my pin to my bank account because I couldn't tell you that. I don't know. If I'm walking across the parking lot and I hear cranes flying over, I will stop, you know, but some of this other stuff is not as important to me. The song or the call and the season. Here in this part of the country, we have a lot of interchange going on where we have birds that are here during the summer months and they may go away during the winter months and the habitat and location that they're found. Have any of you ever seen this guy? He's right here. He's the eastern kingbird. He's a little smaller than a cardinal. He's got that real pretty white edge of the dark part of his tail, and he flies like this because he's hunting insects. Has anybody in the room seen this in the wild? Oh, and he's right here. We gotta get you outside. The simplest of tools, my favorite tool for bird watching is this, the pencil, and a piece of paper. I have little notes probably everywhere. In my car, in the glove box, you know, the thing you're supposed to write down, maybe there was a problem with your car, no, it's full of bird notes. That's the simplest thing that you can do, is to just keep a notebook by the kitchen window that you're watching the bird feeder, or put that notebook in your pocket, if you're using a phone, certainly you can make notes in there. I really like my pencil and paper. That works really well. Another good thing is a decent pair of binoculars. Yes, you can spend $1,200 on a pair of binoculars, but you can also buy one for about 25. And they work pretty good, especially from the kitchen. The other part for me is I don't want one that weighs nine pounds around my neck. So it needs to fit in a pocket or go around my neck and not weigh so much. A bird list. So there's bird lists available. This is a very really old one. This will tell you I'm dated. Dated to the point where I used to do bird counts for Hamilton County Parks, and the very first one I did was in college during those 77 and 78 winters, whew, when it was hard to find birds. Now, you can use your phone, go to eBird, look up any city anywhere, and then create a list. If you're gonna go visit Salt Lake City, Utah, it will create a list and you can print it out if you want and take it with you. So very simple things to use, good checklist. And then a good book, you know you have to decide on which book you wanna use. I am very fond of books. I know everybody has that uh, computer in their pocket and that's fine, but this still works if the battery dies. There's plenty of other resources out there. So if you look at things like that eBird that I mentioned before, or Merlin, which is an app that can be put onto your phone. It's through the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And that is an excellent, excellent resource. I can't say enough good things about Cornell Lab. The National Audubon Society also has an app. But that Cornell Lab, um, Merlin, is from the Cornell Lab of, of Ornithology. And if you want to go to their website, if you have a bird that you think you know, you can look it up by size, shape, or it looks like a cardinal. You can put in, looks like a cardinal, and you'll get an answer back from that. So we're gonna be talking about birds that you can likely see around your feeder or in your backyard. Songbirds, woodpeckers, blackbirds and their kin. We've got a lot of blackbirds coming in in big groups, especially right here in this intersection, you know, they take over the wires that are there. Crows and jays, game birds, and birds of prey. And I wanna tell you that when you have a bird of prey come into your backyard where the bird feeder is and you get your feelings hurt because he ate a little sparrow of some sort, remember, it's a bird feeder. You cannot discriminate. 
My answer to you is you are so lucky to see a red-shouldered hawk come into your yard. So just think about that when it does happen. Okay, top three birds at the feeder. Cardinals, of course. Males are bright red and they have just gone through a color change so they are even brighter than they were say six weeks ago. Females are more of a, a gray green color and they have a bright orange beak in comparison. We have Carolina chickadee. You have to go up north to see the black capped chickadee. But if that's the way you learn it, at least gets, they look so similar. They're really hard to tell apart. But at least you'll be in the ballpark. You'd know that this is a chickadee. And he says his name. Wouldn't that be great if they all said their name? Chickadee dee dee. He's yelling at you when the feeder is empty. And then the tufted titmouse, who's just a little bit bigger, and he's got that crest on the top of his head, and they will both scold you when the feeder is empty. American goldfinch, this is the one you might have grown up calling wild canary. And what people used to think many, 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 many years ago was that the goldfinch went away for the winter. No, it doesn't. It just changes its clothes. They go ahead from that bright, bright, bright yellow and black to a very dull color with just a little bit of yellow on the top of his head. So they're coming into the feeder now. If you still have uh, wonderful native plants in your yard, I hope you do after all these talks we've done, <laughs> and you've left those seed heads, they're gonna be working the seed heads. So you're gonna see these slightly gray, green, yellow birds, about the size of a small sparrow, working the tops of those seed heads. Some of the other sparrows that we can expect to see, the house sparrow is a non-native bird. And what that means is, if you look at the birds that were here prior to European movement into North America, the house sparrow was brought over from England because somebody had the grand idea that it would be so nice if all the birds that were mentioned in Shakespeare's play were brought over to America. That included starlings. See how that turned out? And house sparrow now can live anywhere and eat anything. And they're the ones that in the spring make the nests that have wrappers from cigarettes and pieces of feathers and leftover bags. If it's full of trashy stuff, it's probably that sparrow. But we also have this beauty down here, the white-throated sparrow. And he has that little bit of yellow right next to the eye. And they sing a song, um, they're, they're already here. That's one of those things I go out every day Sometimes not even purposely. I'm just out in the backyard, in the garden or whatever, and I'll hear something going, oh, you can almost tell the time of the year by the birds that you're hearing. So he sings, oh, Canada, Canada, Canada. That's my best bird call for the night. <laughs> and they're pretty uh, easy to see. They'll come into your feeder, but they'll also feed below shrubs or below the feeder. You also have the song sparrow, and they will sit on the outer edge of a naked shrub in the winter time and sing and sing and sing, but they'll also come into the feeder as well. That dark-eyed juncle, that's the one people call the snowbird. Guess what? They're here. It's winter, <laughs> according to the junco. Another way is to think about the silhouettes. And in most of the old types of books, if you grew up in the time of Peterson guides, this was in the front of every Peterson book. And if you took a birding class, you had to study that. And then there would be a test. No test tonight, I promise. But just making yourself do that can really help when you see a bird from a distance. Because nine times out of 10, you're going to see that glimpse or shadow or silhouette and maybe not all of the colors. And that silhouette can tell you a lot. For instance, in the case of this nuthatch, let's see if I can. <laughs> There we go. So look at this shape. Notice this bird is upside down, coming down the tree, head first. He's one of only two birds, three birds, in the state of Ohio that can do that. One of, another one is a nuthatch. So we have the white-breasted nuthatch right here. He comes down the tree. There's the creeper. Look at the way he sits against, against the edge of that. That does want to stay on. But you can see how he's got these really stiff feathers. And he's parked himself like almost like a woodpecker would be. And he's using that slightly curved beak to go inside the little bits of the bark that's on the tree. And then Carolina Wren, she can't go exactly down. 
head first, but she can sit sideways and she will also check every little crevice. Because in those crevices might be seeds, insect larvae, there's lots of goodies in there. So look for those silhouettes. American Robin, uh, American Robin and Eastern uh, Bluebird are very common right now. Now the Bluebird's not as likely to come into your feeder. They're kind of skittish, but if you put out bits of fruit like a cut chopped up apple, you know when that apple gets kind of spongy and maybe nobody else wants to eat it, you can chop that up and put it out for birds. Mealworms, which you can get live, or if that creeps you out too much, you can buy some at the bird feeding store here in uh, Wild Bird Unlimited, and there are some freeze-dried mealworms up there, and they love that. The other thing to bring them in is to make sure you have water, and we'll get to that in a few minutes. But we do have both eastern bluebird, and I can hear them around the edge. I live over in the C section. I live back towards where it connects to the Army Corps property. And I can hear bluebirds coming right up to that edge of where that scrubby woods ends and the neighborhood begins. Some of these other birds that will feed on the ground, I imagine that you have towhees in your neighborhood and you probably just haven't realized they were out there. The males are that dark, dark black with that rusty or rufous sided color. And they like to paw around on the ground. And I use the word paw, I know they don't have paws. But they do this funny little dance with their feet and they're scratching through the leaf litter or the leftover uh, lawn clippings. They're looking for any kind of insect larva or seed that might be there. The female is more kind of a dusty brown and they'll often be out there in pairs, but they can come into your feeder as well. The fox sparrow really likes to be on the ground and he's a little more shy, so he won't come into your feeder as readily as some of the other sparrows. And he's quite big. When you see one, your brain's going, wait a minute, that's a sparrow? Look at the size of that guy. And if you're seeing fox sparrows, that is a really good indicator that you've got great habitat. They don't like too much disturbance. So if you're in the areas around Forest Park where you're near one of these little riparian or creek areas, or you back up to woods, or you're near the parks, you're more likely to see the fox sparrow. And then everybody has morning doves and blue jays. And morning doves will eat both on the ground and on the feeder. And they make a really beautiful sound when their wings, when they fly. <coughs> now blue jay, blue jay is one of the tricksters. Blue jay is in the same family as crows. And blue jay tells tales, because he yells, thieve, thieve, when he's the one who's stealing things. <laughs> he can also make the sound of things like red-shouldered hawks. Why would he do that? Because all the little birds will scatter, and he has the bird feeder to himself. He loves if you put out peanuts, whole peanuts, especially in shells. He'll take them and fly back, and he's caching them somewhere. Sometimes they watch other blue jays to see where their cache is, and they'll raid it. It makes sense. I mean, why work harder than you need to? But I really like listening to them, and the fact that they are so good at mimicking some of these other birds I'll hear that red-shouldered hawk, because we do have them near our house, and I'll go out and looking for it, and then he changes his song. It's like, oh, darn it. Woodpeckers, man, do we have a lot of woodpeckers around. When woodpeckers are working on a tree trunk, they are not killing the tree. There's a whole series, there's a whole timeline of something going on in that tree. So the tree has probably suffered a disease, is more prone to insect, and woodpeckers are hearing that insect, especially that larva, um, beetle larva, eating below the surface. And so they're pulling off those bits of bark to get into where those chambers are that the beetles are eating through. So even something like um, emerald ash borer, they can hear the larva of that insect chewing through the wood, and they'll start pulling off that um, bark to get to them. The male flicker that's on the side over here, he's got that big black bib right here. That's how you know that that's the male. But he has these very bright yellow feathers underneath. And you might see him down on the ground. He's here all year round, but they like to be down on the ground rather than on a feeder. And during the summer, they'll actually, if they find an, um, a mound of ants, they'll actually eat the ants from that uh, mound. 
We have red-bellied woodpecker, which I want to know who named this red belly. Do you see a red belly? No. no. It kind of looks like somebody put their hand in a little bit of red paint and a little bit of water and went like this. So not very much red at all. But maybe because there was already a red-headed woodpecker, and we'll see that in a minute. But you can see the male and female here. The male has more red on the back of his head. It goes almost down to what you think of that shoulder area. She just has a little bit right across the, the back of her head. Look at that size that I put in there, 9.5 inches. I think that's, you know, that's longer than a pencil. So find a reference point that works for you and, that, and just stick with it. Here's the other woodpeckers. There's the red-headed woodpecker. We do not have them in this part of Hamilton County. If you go out to Miami Whitewater or you go out to the east into Goshen, Bethel, and so on, further out beyond that, you need mature woods, undisturbed, for the red-headed woodpecker to be here. And they are really that bright, bright red, full white, and dark. And they will fuss at you if you're walking through the woods. They'll follow around above you as if they're telling everybody else, somebody new is here. But all of these will come into the feeder if you, might, if you have one up during the winter time. One of the oddball ones, see if I can get that to work. Oh, nope. Let's go back up there. All right. So this one right here, this is the yellow-bellied sapsucker. Now, doesn't that sound like something you might start a bar fight with? He's a yellow-bellied sapsucker. But they are yellow-bellied. It's a kind of a lemony yellow. They have a little bit of red on their head. And they do. They make those wells. There's two different types of wells that they make. One looks like necklaces around the edge of that tree. And you'll see them year after year. They make these tiny little wells. The sap oozes out. They get both the benefits of the sap and the insects that come to eat the sap. They will eat those as well. Can that damage the tree? A little bit. It's a pretty small hole, but any hole that goes through the bark into that sap layer is a spot where uh, bacteria or other pathogens can get in. On the other hand, this one, look at those. Those are about the size of the, my baby finger, the tip of my baby finger. And that type can really can cause some damage. But a lot more insects will come into that. And on warm winter days, you'll see sap dripping off of that. So now you can check the trees in the backyard. And if it looks like it has a necklace, you know the sap suckers have been around. Woodpeckers, this is the largest woodpecker that we still have that's around here. We're talking about something about the size of a crow. They have that wonderful crest on their head. And we can tell male from female. So this guy has a mustache. And this one does not. Here's a youngster. You can tell his pileum hasn't quite formed yet down on the ground. And that was actually taken. Well, like I said, we're in the C section. It backs up to Army Corps property. And a big tree had fallen. And we were watching them work that. And we got to see the young come in. And really, you just see flakes of that tree flying all over the place. When they make those holes, though, that provides habitat for other animals. So things like screech owls, flying squirrels, uh, bluebirds will use their hole. Other types of birds, bats, will also take refuge in there. Blackbirds and their kin. OK, so starlings were brought over. Again, that grand idea that we should have every bird that's in Shakespeare's play in the United States. I don't know why. <laughs> and if you see one starling, during their breeding plumage with those tiny teardrop spots on them. They're really beautiful. They're very smart, and they can mimic all kinds of other sounds. They can mimic human voices. They can mimic whistles. Um, they can mimic birds of prey. And they are the ones that get into these huge flocks that you might see that almost look like schools of fish up in the sky. I know this particular intersection right here at Winton and Kemper they will line up on all of those wires, and you watch them, especially as night's coming in. They will be there for, until the, it's like they gather everybody in one place, and then somebody gives the message, and they go and fly someplace else for the night. 
But we also have common grackles that will end up in a group, not quite like that. And then red-winged blackbirds, which don't migrate like they used to. They are still able to find so much open water. They're able to get the food that they need. And they will come into your feeder, too. If you're somewhere near the creek, the pond, the retention basin, Winton Lake, any of those, they will come up to the feeder if you have some good stuff. And crows. We have crows that would gather into these very large groups in the wintertime. Do you remember the birds, the movie? <laughs> I know there's some younger people who haven't seen it. When that came out, we were probably all afraid to walk home, weren't we? Right. Well, crows gather in these very large groups in the wintertime. We're talking thousands and thousands of birds. And what they do is they gather together first in a place like Spring Grove Cemetery. Then they might end up in Eden Park. And they're squawking and carrying on thousands of birds. And just before the last bit of light, again, like the other blackbirds, somebody gives a message and they disperse and are hiding up in trees that might be near a building because they learn that can be protection for them. So you don't think about the city as providing protection, but it's a few degrees warmer. If they're on the right side of the building, they will be blocked from rain, wind, and snow. And when the sun comes up, they come back north. It's, it's almost like a com uh, com commuter, where they're down in the city overnight, but they're flying back up here. And often in the wintertime, we see them at Rumkeys. There will be a steady line of crows on the move. They are incredibly smart. They recognize people and dogs. They are great problem solvers. I mean, if you, uh, they can get into the trash bin. If, if the trash is open enough, they can start pulling it open, and then you're going to blame somebody else's dog for getting into the trash when it might have been the crow. If you have bits, uh, that was a puzzle that was put out for them. But many years ago, when milk was delivered to our doorsteps, crows learned they could peel back that pog or then pull back that foil and get to the cream on top. And they have documenting them using tools, finding the right shaped stick to push into a puzzle box to get the treat out. I have a fondness for crows, in case you hadn't figured that out. The crow knows. As I mentioned before, birds like bird feeders too. Like, you can't discriminate. Everybody has to eat. For every strike that they make at a bird feeder, maybe 1 in 10 will be successful. So your heart might break a little bit because maybe that was your favorite chipping sparrow, song sparrow, whatever it might have been. But the fact that you got to see that raptor, I want to make that on a positive side. You got to see this bird of prey up close when most people will go their whole life and never have the opportunity to see that. I have a neighbor that has tall grasses that she leaves up during the winter time. And around that is a big, tall fence on one side. And the red-shouldered hawk will come and sit on that and look down in the grasses because mice and other little birds will hide in there. So it's become a little bit like a smorgasbord. But we do have red-tailed hawk. They're about 22 inches tall. The red-shouldered hawk, which is almost exclusively a bird eater. The cooper's hawk. And man, they, they look like they're dive bombing. I mean, they look like little kamikaze flyers in between the houses and next to the bird feeders. That's a male with that darker color. The females look a lot like the red-shouldered hawk in the middle there. And then we rarely see kestrels. This is the one you might have known as sparrowhawk. So not very big, about the size of my hand extended. But we don't see them as often. It used to be in the median on 275 here, every little bit you'd see that sparrowhawk, that kestrel, hovering, looking for mice. We just don't see that. I think there's just too much human pressure for some of these habitats, especially for kestrels. The thing about feeders is you have to decide what works for you. Obviously, depending on the type of bird that you want to bring into the yard is, is part of your bearing on what you choose the type of feeder. I would suggest always to buy the best bird feeder you can because, sure, you can go to any little side store and buy a plastic thing, but it won't last very long. It will freeze and thaw and break. The squirrels will chew through it. The raccoons will pull it down. And so that's something to think about. You know, maybe you want to invest. It, some of them are pretty hefty, 
both in the way they feel but in their cost, but it'll probably be the only one you ever have to buy as long as you take care of it. So you have these hoppers that have a top and then basin that you put the seed into. You just want to make sure that you keep it clean. Uh, this one has glass, it looks like the gazebo there, and it has glass or plastic. In most cases it's plastic so that you can see how full it is while you're still inside and it's warm and snuggly and it's snowing. Then these other platform feeders, one is hanging and here's one on a pole. And that allows things like uh, morning doves and other ground feeders will come up and use these platform feeders as well. Favorite seeds, and I think one of the handouts was a chart on some of the favorite seeds. So depending on the type of seed that you use, may bring in different types of birds. Things like we talked about before that jays really love whole peanuts. They think that's, I mean, that's a puzzle box to them. So they like that as well. But if you could get peanut hearts or whole peanuts, not salted, don't use salted or honey roasted. If you put the honey roasted out there, the squirrels will thank you. But they don't need that extra salt. So just go with the raw peanuts. You can use safflower seed. Now it was said when safflower seed came out that the squirrels and the chipmunks weren't as interested in it. I'm here to tell you the squirrels and chipmunks in my neighborhood absolutely adore it. I don't have it in my yard, but my neighbor does. I have safflower coming up in my vegetable garden every year. <laughs> because they come in, they unload their little chubby cheeks into the soil and I'll find 10, 12, 15 coming up in the soil. The sunflower seeds, the best bang for your buck is going to be the black oil sunflower seed, and there are a few examples of the different types up here. And the reason for that is if you look at the size, the striped sunflower seed is the big one that you might eat when you go to the ball game. That's what the ball players are spitting. They're spitting out those shells. The shell is much bigger than the nut meat that's on the inside. Whereas the black oil sunflower seed, there's the shell and the nut meat are really matched size for size. So it's a much better bargain in terms of energy for the bird to be able to use that. Now you can also get, I think I have that on there. We'll get to it in a minute. Nope, nope. all right. There's what they call a no mess mix. And that's up here on the um, table as well. And there are no husks. So there's no sunflower husks. There's no safflower husks. And that means it's clean underneath. Everything's gonna be eaten. There's very little filler in something like that. It, it's a little pricier, but there's not the mess. You're not throwing away bags and bags and bags of sunflower seed. And the other thing about sunflower seed is that those seeds, if they're left on the ground, have what's called an allopathic effect. In other words, they're putting out a chemical into the lawn and into the other plants. They don't play well with others. So what you're gonna have is a, a area that has died back because it's been treated by the chemicals that's being uh, coming out of, exuded from the sunflower shells. At our house, we just, I'll break them up a little bit and I'll put them into the compost because then they're gonna get mixed around and that helps with some aeration. Niger seed, Niger is not a thistle. If you call me and say, doggone it, I have thistle coming up underneath my bird feeder, you probably do, but it did not come from the Niger seed. Niger seed is from a completely different type of plant. It's not native to this country and it goes through a very special heat treatment so that it cannot grow. It is not viable. So what you buy at the bird feed store or at the feed mill, if you ask for Niger or thistle with my quotations, it's not truly a thistle. It's a completely different plant that's part of the aster family. If you have thistles coming underneath your bird feeder, that's because birds like to eat thistles and we have native thistles and we have non-native thistles that just grow all over the place. And when birds eat something, then something else comes out. So they're planting those thistle seeds where they're stopping for a minute. The type of feeder is very specific for thistle seed. I'm sure you already know that. It's a clear plastic or glass. Some of them are pretty heavy weighted with tiny little uh, slits for that seed to come out. It really is a tiny little seed. And because the slits on the feeder are very small, very few types of birds, and most of it is goldfinch, can get the seed out of the cracks or those little openings. And that way you don't waste it by having the other big bullies come in and eat it all. Sometimes they even have upside down thistle feeders 
because even though you have the small openings, the way that it's constructed, the goldfinch can hang upside down and get to the seed where some of these other birds might be able to reach that, but they don't have the wherewithal. They're not smart enough to hang upside down to get to that seed. So here's something like that common thistle that you see by the roadside. Yes, it may grow underneath your bird feeder, but it did not come from the thistle, thistle seed, which is actually Niger seed that you buy at the bird feeding store. Suet is that really dense, heavy fat that comes from uh, cows, especially around the kidney. That was the best type. And it used to be you could go to the butcher and say, I need a pound of suet. He'd go, OK, there you go. It was cast off. Nope, nothing's free anymore. <laughs> so you can buy suet and render it yourself. That's fine. Or you can buy suet cakes, something like this. And it can last all season. And they add in all kinds of flavors. This one has, uh, this is called a no melt suet dough. Um, this one also has red pepper in it to try and reduce the squirrels from eating it. However, I've met squirrels who I think they really like salsa, so it's fine. That doesn't stop them at all. But this one has corn, peanuts, uh, beef suet, oats, and pepper, and a little bit of soy oil in it. But there's many flavors. Some of them might have dried fruit in it. And just buy some good quality. Um, if you decide you're going to make something like that on your own, you can also, if you're, if you're not wanting to use animal product, you can use something like a, a good uh, shortening, a solid shortening, and add a little peanut butter. Then you can put some peanut hearts or some oats in there and pour it into a little paper cup and let it freeze. And then you can tie that onto your tree like an ornament and let the birds eat away at it. Just store them in the freezer, because if they put them out on the counter, they will melt. Don't forget the water. Don't forget the water. I know we haven't had too many super cold days yet. We have had a few hard freezes. And so if you have an outdoor bird bath, make sure that you're adding water to that. And make sure it's something that can sustain during the winter. You hate to have something that's going to freeze and thaw and crack. So buy a good quality. Uh, piece that's out there. You can also buy heated bird baths, or you can also go to the farm store and buy a heated dog bowl, meant to be outside, put some rocks in it so that it's not so deep, and that way the birds can get to the water and then you will be the, you know, the favorite place in the neighborhood because you have that open water. If you have open water in the winter time, especially if we have a long haul where we have freeze or snow, the birds are really going to be drawn to that. And you may have noticed that on a, a warm day, you go out to the market or the mall or something, and there's a little open puddle on the black asphalt, and all the birds are out there taking advantage of it. Don't forget the water. That's my little pond in my backyard. Now, even though that one is about three feet deep, it does have a shelf around it. And then in the summer, when the water sprays over it, there's a nice wide shelf where a bird could come in and get a little water without being in that pool, because any of the birds that need to come in for water, such as the robin, are not going to do very well in three feet of water. And then, of course, me, I'm always beating this drum. Go native. The more native plants and shrubs and trees that you can put into your yard, the more you're going to provide for the birds that you want to see. And you can do it really simply by adding some of the simplest things that you may already know. Black-eyed Susans, purple coneflower. You may have the New England Aster. Maybe you had a lot of those. They just finished blooming, oh, probably at the end of October. They were almost as tall as me with big purple flowers. Don't be so tempted to cut them off. Go ahead and let those flower heads be so the birds can use those seeds during the winter. The other thing about those stems is that they may have insects in them, and the downy woodpecker will come and check each one of those looking for that little tidbit. A little bit of our replanting going on there, of course. Things like that purple coneflower, if you don't cut that back, that seed head in the center that forms is a great place for things like that goldfinch to come and feed. They'll use that during the winter time. So in, in terms of not cleaning up the garden as quickly as you are, you might be so tempted. I don't know why we're so tempted to go out there and make it all shiny. Good places to hide, especially in the summertime for them. 
So here's another one of those shots where I'm talking about these things that are drying off. That's ironweed, that one that's uh, right here. This is ironweed, and that's a mountain mint. There's the bergamot, and those kind of seed heads will provide food for birds later in the season. They are some of the late season pollinators, so you get insects, which also brings in birds, and then once they go to seed, the birds will benefit from them in the winter months. So the more variety of things that you have, because we feed the birds really for ourselves. We want to see the birds up close, so we put the feeders out there and decide the types of seed we're going to use. But you want to offer these other good things for them. It's kind of like if, if all you eat is chips and salsa, you're not going to be a very healthy person. So you need these other variety pieces. Right now we've got frost weed, so the, the seed remains, the birds can have that, and the, seed, the stems have already started to split in that last time we had a 29 degree day. We have this wonderful frost, this ice flower formation that comes out. How does that benefit the birds? It becomes another source of water down on the ground, kind of around where that area that we did not clean up, that's another source of water if there's not open water for them to get to. Other types of shrubs that you can include in, same thing. Now you might be grumpy because the birds come in and of course they, you know, if they eat something red then there might be something red at the other end that comes out. Uh, right now we see, you know, the ha honeysuckle berries are crazy all over the place. Those are not native. They're so alluring to birds because they're red. That's one of the colors that birds um, almost automatically go to. If it's red they want to eat it, they want to try it. And so I would encourage you to look at something else, like this fragrant sumac that puts on red berries, the dogwood that puts on red berries. There's plenty of other varieties of native plants you can use that will draw them in. Oh, let me go back on that. Okay, so there's a birdhouse. I often get questions about leaving your birdhouse up over the winter. Yes, please do. In fact, if there's a bird nest in it, leave it, because those little sticks and bits will be protection if we get some really bad weather, chickadees and titmice will go into those and take some refuge. So we'll wren if the hole is big enough, take refuge in those when we have really bad weather. By the time we get to late February and March, that's time to go and clean them out. If you're trying to get chickadees to nest or bluebirds to nest, bluebird is not like a dirty house. So that's the time to go and clean that house out Give it a good scraping out. Make sure there's no mice, because they might have also taken over that spot for the winter time. But if you have a birdhouse out like that, leave it up for the winter. And then those great dogwood berries. I mean, that red color, if you have mockingbird. Now, mockingbird can be a bully. I'm sure you've seen him come into the feeder, and he chases everybody off. And you might try putting separate feeders. And he'll do the same thing if he finds a dogwood tree. He will try and protect that from the other birds coming in to get it. My advice would be plant another with dogwood tree. <laughs> Even in the winter time, in fact, we have winter bird counts. The Christmas bird count is more than 100 years old. The Audubon Society started that all these years ago. And people still go out. They get in their super insulated stuff and they go out in some really lousy weather or really nice weather and count the varieties of birds that they see and the numbers each year. And you think, why would anybody want to do that? Hey, I was a competitive birder for a while, so yes, I was one of those bird nerds. The reason for that is if we count the birds this year that you see just say in your backyard, that one year means a little bit. But if you have three years, five years, 10 years, 30 years of data, now you can see the trends and you can also go back and look at the weather. So in the years that we had those super bad winters here in Cincinnati in 77 and 78, robins, bluebirds, and Carolina wrens, the next year, the numbers really plummeted because it was so deep with snow and then became so cold, it took such a toll, they could not get to food or open water. So think about that. You might just be doing that backyard bird count in your own backyard. You know, there's more than 60 million bird watchers. Think about that. Think about the economic value of bird watching in the United States. 
or all over the world. People plan vacations to go to places, you know, down to South America, to um, islands all over the place, to, to Tahiti, to Finland, to Alaska. We went to Alaska for birds. We went out there in some really crazy weather looking for things. Why? Because it's, we share this planet. We want to see as much as we can see. And when you do that, when you slow yourself down, competitive birding is not slow, I'll tell you that. But I'm telling you, when you're watching birds out the window with your cup of tea or your morning coffee, you're slowing yourself down and you're taking that enjoyment. But you're also noticing some behaviors in birds that you may not have ever thought about. I mean, isn't that a gorgeous picture? This bird is just stretching that wing out. It's just the same thing as you and I giving a big stretch in the morning. But because you took that moment to be still, you got to see not only the color of that bird, but maybe a behavior that you hadn't seen before. Ohio has more than 400 species of birds. How many do you have in your backyard? So that's going to be your homework. There's no test, but that will be your homework to start your winter birding list to find out what you're seeing, especially over the winter. Okay, so I have a few other things on the table I want to tell you about. One of them is, I'm going to pick on you for a minute. You put your hand down. Okay. She is holding the weight of one cardinal. So look at this. These are all paper clips. That's the weight of one cardinal. If I gave you a penny, that's how much the hummingbird weighs before it doubles its weight and flies off to South America for the, for the winter. Wow, it weighs a whole penny. So when you think about what birds do, the other reason they're able to do that is because they tend to have what we think of as hollow bones. It's not hollow like a straw, but it doesn't have the marrow, the thick, dense bones, because they need to fly. Well, unless you're an ostrich, or a penguin, <laughs> or a kiwi. But you can see where their bones are meant for flight. They have those big breast muscles. They have that really strong sternum that holds those muscles together. And when they're able to do that, they can go from very simple flights or ridiculous flights. Do you know wild turkeys fly? We have wild turkeys right here in Hamilton County, right here in Forest Park. Those birds will be 25 feet up in the trees. And I'll tell you, if you're ever taking a walk before dawn and you spook some turkeys, your heart's going to race so fast you think you're going to, you know, you feel like Sasquatch is coming out after you when these birds come out. We have them in our yard. They come up from that Army Corps property, and they hang out underneath the feeder by the neighbor's house. So the idea that I, when I've been Forest Park now 30-some years, the idea that I would have turkey in my backyard never occurred to me. But here we are because they've adapted so well. Other than the part about them fighting themselves in the neighbor's car, I'm not sure what that is. Pretty silly. All right. Um, other things in terms of mentioning, let's see. Other things that are on the table. So if you have birds of prey, and you'll have to come up to the table and look at this. If you have big tree in your yard and you're finding some funny little, looks like hairballs underneath your tree, that is a good sign that you have a bird of prey that is casting pellets. So he's eaten his supper, and then in 24 hours he casts up. It's a polite way of saying regurgitating. And what is in there is going to be feathers or fur and bones and teeth. And then when you find that pellet, you can actually see what happens to be in it. I think if, if you look carefully, you can see the incisors of the rat or the mouse, that, this one. So this is a great horned owl. And this is a screech owl, which we have right here in Forest Park, as well as the barred owl we saw at the beginning. So you can take a look at those. Great turkey feathers. If I'd shown you that one first, would you have known it was a turkey? No, that's part of the wing feather. But you'd know that one. I think he's going to make himself pretty scarce between now and next week. The birds that we buy for Thanksgiving are bred differently to have much more breast muscle, and they don't live much past about six months. They're so heavy, their body and their bones, 
break down, they end up with problems in their feet because they get so big. A wild turkey, a male, might top out at about 24 pounds. He can also run about 20 miles per hour. Those big white turkeys, all they run for is the dinner bell. All right, another thing, and we have some of this on the table, is uh, occasionally I get calls about birds striking the window. What do you do about that? Now, oh, you can't close the window curtains because if you do that, it just makes a better mirror on the outside. And right now, the way the sunlight is, especially on a nice morning, if you have an eastern or southern facing window, the reflection is going to look like open sky. So what you want to do is something on the outside of the glass. This is mylar tape, but it could just as easily be some long plastic, you know, you cut up some grocery bags. It has to be on the outside and long enough that it will move. So you're breaking up that mirrored effect. Even though this looks like it's mirrored, it has facets that you, don't, I, you and I don't see. And it bounces light, so that catches the bird's eye to be aware. It breaks up the pattern of the sky that looks like it's an open airway for them. I'm sure you've all had birds hit the window. And should that happen, I always run out to look to see if that bird's down on the ground. If that should happen, you can do a few things. You can just watch and see if he's OK. If you feel brave enough, get a big paper bag, gently with a gloved hand, put him into the paper bag, roll it down, put a paper clip or a clothespin or something on the top, put it underneath the porch in the garage. Do not bring it in the house. It's too warm. Our houses are too dry. And if you have pets, that's a problem. And you don't want it getting loose in the house. Then you're going to wait about one hour, because often what happens is they just stun themselves. You're going to wait about one hour. Take that bag outside to check it, because if you open it inside, brrr, he's going to fly past you. And in most cases, I'd say probably 80% or more out of the time, they just got stunned a little bit. They just needed a little quiet, dark place to recuperate, and they're going to fly off. So you can certainly do that. It's better not to handle them because you put down a scent on their body, uh, and that can attract, especially if they're down on the ground, that can attract other predators to them. All right. So I guess we can go to the questions portion. Thank you so much. I know that was blitzkrieg, wild, fast. I'm a bird nerd, and I can't stop talking about it. Okay, if anybody has a question, just raise your hand and come on up and feel free to ask the question. I just have one question about birdhouses. Uh -huh. Where is the best location to put them? I've read a lot about not putting them in a tree because it, another uh, predator could get to them, uh, not putting them too close to the feeders because the same right. reason. Where in the yard? Where First, it depends on what you're trying to attract. So there are some bigger bird feeder or bird houses that will need to go up higher. So if you're doing something like a chickadee, a titmouse, you saw the one in the picture I had, that's probably about five feet high. Now, that one happens to open to the west, which I would normally tell you not to do. They usually say have their, the hole opening to the south or to the east, so it's away from the prevailing winds. It's best not to have that too close to the feeder, because you've got so much activity that may actually startle that female or interrupt her while she's making the nest, or bring in other birds that may parasitize or attack the eggs that are in that nest. So the first thing is to think about the birds that you want to attract, and then decide if the habitat that you have will attract them in. For instance, the bluebirds I was talking about, I've never had a bluebird. I can hear them. They have not come into my yard and nested. I have chickadees, I have titmice, I have wren that use those nesting boxes. And then other birds like robins, they want an open platform. So it's going to be a box that's like this. It's just an open platform with a little roof to keep the rain off. And that can go on the upper side of a patio, the side of the house, a, a, the side of a tree for that matter. But that one would be up a little higher, probably 8 to 10 feet up off the ground. 
And that's easy enough to find. In fact, the Department of Natural Resources here in the state of Ohio, you just put Ohio Department of Natural Resources birds and you'll get the information. They even have the patterns. So you know if you want to build a woodpecker box, a barred owl box, a chickadee box, they have all of the information on what shape and size and how to orient it in your yard. Yeah, great question. Yeah, thank you. All right, well that concludes our environmental seminar series. I am so glad that y'all were able to come to some of these, if not all of them. I recognize a lot of faces. Yeah. Uh, we are going, we're in negotiations to do this again next year on different topics. So please keep your eyes on your emails or check out our website because we hope to have something starting maybe in April or May. But until then, y'all have a great time. I uh, wish y'all the best with the holidays and take care. Thank you for coming. Feel free to come up and talk with Carol too. I, I'm, I'm sure there's some other things she can show you or tell you about.